key pricing means that where our focus as a business is how can we create more value for our clients how can we change their lives how can we make as big a difference as possible knowing that the more of a difference we make we can also also charge a higher price so we create a win-win we both win from that the customer gets a better result gets a better solution we get a better price and we make more money so we we need to shift away from this cost plus mentality towards value pricing Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that has grown several businesses to seven and eight figure companies, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where we help startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. And today we have a guest and I'm excited. I'm excited about all my guests, but I'm particularly excited about this guest in the sense that so as a short background to the audience, so I, I've been on a few other podcasts and one of the other podcasts I was on was with uh, uh, was called Profit with Law and it's with Moshe Amsel. I love his podcast and one of the and he's more on the accountant side. He's kind of more on the works with the the money side and helping people to run it. But as we were talking, we got into the conversation as I was a guest on his podcast about flat fees and how you actually you know. For example, when should you increase your rates? How much should you increase your rates? You know, what should you do a flat fee model? How can you make it profitable and those type of things? And so Moshe, when I was on there, mentioned uh, Mark and Mark uh, Wickersham um, was a, had a great book out there and I've started to, and I haven't finished it, not because I don't, I'm not excited to finish it, but I'm working my way through, but it was so in, in popular on demand and Amazon. It was one, it's, a, it's an expensive book and it's, it's probably the most money I've ever spent on a book which isn't a, no I tell you that back I spent more on law school books than I did on his book but it's one and it uh, it was one that was uh, it took me a little while to get in the mail and so I'm, I'm I plowed my way through it and in the meantime I reached out to Mark and said hey this is a fun book I'm excited to read it and I'm, I'm working my through way through it would you ever want to come on the podcast he graciously agreed and so he's on the podcast today and on our expert episode to kind of talk through a little bit more about pricing and how you that affects profits and he takes it from a you know, a CPA or finance perspective and accountants and those type of things. But I think there's a lot of information to leverage from, you know, other industries. So whatever industry you're in, you should be looking at other industries. How are they doing it? How can I apply this in my industry? So that's the conversation I look forward to having with Mark. So with that, welcome onto the podcast, Mark. Well, thank you. Thank you for that welcome. That's, that's awesome. I'm, I'm excited to be here and share a few thoughts. So I gave you a brief, or everybody kind of a brief introduction, but maybe just uh, take a couple minutes, introduce yourself to the audience, kind of what you've done, the books you've wrote, the things that you've done, and kind of give everybody a bit of a, an idea of your experience. Yeah, of course. So uh, as you've said, my name is Mark Wickersham. I'm an accountant, a chartered accountant from the UK, which uh, you can probably tell by the accent. And I entered the profession uh, way, way back now in 1988, uh, qualified as a chartered accountant. And then in May 96, I started up my own business, my own accounting firm. I, I had a, a spare bedroom in the house, bought a computer, bought a desk, and then went out there to try and win clients. And surprisingly, for the first two and a half years, I grew incredibly fast. Uh, I moved into my first premises within two, two and a half months of starting. I hired people. And if you were looking at my business from the outside looking in, you might have thought, wow, Mark's building a successful accounting business. Mm. The reality is those first two and a half years, I made every mistake in the book. My life was a mess two and a half years in. By the end of 1998, I, I was struggling. I, I was growing fast, but I was growing because I was constantly going back to the bank manager with a begging bowl saying, please, sir, can I have some more, more funds, another overdraft, so another loan uh, to finance this growth? Mm. And, and I found by the end of 98, like a lot of small businesses, I, I was working crazy hard, crazy long hours mm. uh, just to make ends meet. Uh, and it wasn't until end of 98 that I, I had a, a chance encounter with someone who changed my life and changed my thinking about how you run a, a business. Uh, and that led me on an interesting journey. I then made some significant changes in my business. I first came across, it was in 1999, the concept value pricing, pricing based on value. Uh, and, and that for me triggered something that just made so much sense. So I, I completely changed the way that I priced and, and turned the firm around to a stage where I could then sell it. 
And I was then asked to start speaking to other firms of accountants about how I did that. Uh, and very soon I became known as the pricing person. I wrote my first book in 2011. It was published. It was called Effective Pricing for Accountants. Mm. Uh, I've wrote, written a couple more for the accounting profession. And the one you kindly mentioned earlier, which is the last book I wrote, was this one, uh, Price the Fast Way to Change Profit, which is the first book I've written that's not exclusively for the accounting profession. And I said, it looks just like the one that I have on, or on my desk. So that was amazing. So, no. That's the one. <laughs> So the awesome. Well, I think that that's a fun introduction. So, and I, I like how, you know, you figure, I, I think that too often you should think about it. Pricing is certainly a major part of a company. And yet it's almost sometimes an afterthought of, of with a lot of businesses of their focus on their service or their goods or what they're doing. And you never really think of how you, especially in the services industry, how you should do pricing. So maybe give us a little bit of an idea when you're going through that and kind of having your revelation and doing it. What did, what were some of the things you learned about pricing or kind of what is some of the things that people should consider when they're looking at pricing? Yeah, well, I, in the accounting industry, I kind of grew up in the profession believing that you had to price based on the hour. And, and, and I thought naively that you had to keep timesheets, you had to log hours, and then you would bill the client based on hours. So that's what I did. I just blindly followed the, the, the past. And what I learned later is that uh, that's a form of pricing called cost plus pricing, where you add up your costs add on a hopeful margin and magically there's your profits, uh, 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 your price, sorry. And then I realized later that actually the customer doesn't care in the slightest what your internal costs are. The customer doesn't care what your costs are. The customer doesn't care what profit margin you want to make. The customer only cares about what value can you deliver to them? And as long as you can deliver enough value and communicate that value, and as long as that value is greater than the price you charge, the customer's happy and they'll buy. They don't care about your costs. And I didn't realize this at the time. I, I went down this route of just adding up hours. And I know it's common in the, the legal profession as well. That's a particularly crazy way to price. And it's crazy for a whole host of reasons. And, and I sometimes deal with lawyers. And the thing that I hate the most is I say to them, what's it going to cost? Oh, it's $300 an hour. <laughs> Please don't have to do with lawyers too often because that's the <laughs> time that's never a fun experience. But go ahead. But yeah. And so the, the, obviously the next question you're going to ask is, yes, but how long is it going to take? Well, we don't know. We haven't done the work yet. And as, a, as accountants, that's what we would do to our clients. We'd say, we don't know what the price is. Wait till we've done the work. And then we'll add up the hours and then we'll send you this surprise bill that will always be a shock. Mm. And, and I kind of wondered, why did my customers always complain about the bills all the time? Well, I now look back and think, well, it's plainly obvious. We have to change the way that we price and price in a way that's fairer to the customer. Mm. No, I love that. And, and you are, I know you're in the accounting industry, but that mirrors almost exactly the exact same pain points in the legal industry. And I think service industry in general is, you know, if you're in the services and you accounting's one, legal's one, and we'll hit on those, but really I think it's a broader, you know, broader thing. Uh, if you're always saying, you know, so I'll give you from the, the legal perspective uh, is, you know, we le law firms for a long time and most law firms still are there. Just as you mentioned, we do the billable hour and we say, how much is it going to take? Well, I think it will take, I don't know, and I'm making up 10, 15 hours. And then they'll say, okay, you know, and that they, then they kind of set in their mind the expectations. And then you spend 20 hours because it took longer and they're unhappy. And if you spend nine hours then they're saying, well, that's about what I expected. And you're, and if you go over 10, that 10 or 15 hours, there's always a pressure to write off your time or write it down or to not build a client because you're always worried that I've got to keep that relationship and I've gone, I've spent too much time. And so it's always that struggle. And I think it's both the struggle attorneys and, and themselves are facing of how do I not make the client unhappy. And at the same time, the clients are always unhappy because they're always getting bills that they don't know what there's going to be. And it's kind of like if you're to go into a car, and I always think of uh, car sales, if I were to go into a, you know, a car dealer and say, I'd like to buy a car. And they say, and they say, how much is it? Well, we don't know. Why don't you buy the car? And then we'll, we'll tell you what the price is. And then you're saying, well, I need to know what the price is before I buy. No, that's not how it works. So that's kind of how it feels like for a lot of the industries, we've set up pricing. And so maybe get an insight as you were saying, you know, let's, 
you mentioned value-based pricing, which I, I'm a believer in as well, but maybe for those that aren't familiar, what is value-based pricing and kind of how do, how do you make that shift? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Cause, and there's a lot of confusion around pricing because there are so many terms that we hear, uh, mm -hmm. things like percentage pricing, contingent pricing, demand-based pricing, time-based billing, fixed fees, flat fees, uh, and it's confusing. But actually, if we really drill it down, there's only really two ways to price. Mm. That's it, two ways. One of them is called cost plus pricing, mm. which I've mentioned, where you simply add up your costs, add on a hope for profit margin, and magically there's your price. And as I said, that the customer has no interest in your internal costs or, or your profit margins. And, and it was demonstrated uh, over 100 years ago by the Austrian School of Economists. It's a crazy way to price because mm. it ignores what customers want. The only other way to price is value pricing, which mm. starts the other way. So run starting with costs, we start with the customer first. We look at what does the customer want? What does the customer value? Mm. And then we price based upon the value, nothing to do with costs. And that means that if we can create more value for our customers, then we can also have a higher price, which means we make more profits. And so the nice thing about value pricing is it, it's it creates a win-win it's a fairer way of pricing if we think about cost plus pricing and i'll use the professions as an example because timesheets is is the way that we bill based on the hour mm. it's a it's a win-lose way of pricing because if you think about it if you're a, a, an attorney a lawyer a, an accountant a bookkeeper if you want to wait make more money it's really simple you just work a bit slower and you put more money and time on the timesheet. And that's exactly what the, the customer doesn't want. So mm. you're at odds. Whereas value pricing means that we're, our focus as a business is how can we create more value for our clients? How can we change their lives? How can we make as big a difference as possible? Knowing that the more of a difference we make, we can also, also charge a higher price. So we create a win-win we both win from that the customer gets a better result gets a better solution we get a better price and we make more money so we we need to shift away from this cost plus mentality towards value pricing and the confusion as i said is there's a there's a whole array of different mm. pricing methodologies whether it's whether it's um, time-based billing contingent pricing whatever these are just pricing models there are, I'm aware of at least 40 plus pricing models. Mm. All these pricing models are either a form of cost plus pricing or a form of value pricing or somewhere in between a hybrid. So there are many models that we can use, but we want to make sure that we focus on the ones that are in the value pricing space and start to, to shift towards, towards value pricing. Mm. No, I think I'm. I think that's, that's a very great, a good explanation. Now I'm going to follow up with a couple of questions for you. So let's say in whatever service industry, if you can take the accounting industry or legal industry, whatever one that makes sense. But you know, how do you figure out your value that you're offering to a client? Because I mean, I think it sounds great in theory, and then people are going to come and say, "No, I, I'm a believer. If I can get it, so that I'm not having to do the billable hour, the hours, and the hour tracking time." all for it but now how do i figure out what is that value i offer and i was you know and i think people are worried that they overprice it and they they don't understand the value or they underprice it and leave money on the table so how do you kind of reach that what is your value that you is for value-based pricing yeah that's a, that's a great question and it's it's what makes it difficult I, and particularly i think in the accounting profession because accountants bookkeepers want things to be precise and accurate and 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 timesheets give them some sort of comfort because there's a false belief that accurate uh, measuring cost is accurate, which is not the case, the reality, but they believe that. The problem with value-based pricing is value is, it's subjective. You can't touch, feel, measure value. Mm. Not only that is every customer values things differently. Mm. And so that creates this real complexity. So, uh, so how do we understand what value is? Well, one of the things we can't do, unfortunately, is we can't ask the customer what they value. So whatever we're selling, whether you're selling a, a book, accounting services, tax returns, or whatever it might well be, you can't say to the customer, so please tell me, what's the most that you're willing to pay for this product, this service? Because the customer won't say that. They won't tell you. If they give you a number, they're lying because they'll give you a low number. So unfortunately, we can't ask. Instead, we've got to figure out uh, and we do that through a bunch of different techniques that, uh, that we can use to start to understand uh, what people value. 
Mm. And so let me share one with you. I mean, there's many things we can do, but if I share one, which is the one that most people then start to understand because we see it in the world around us. Mm. I call it menu pricing. Mm. Uh, we have to recognize that everybody values things differently and, and everybody's an individual. So we, we want to give them choice. People love choice. They like to go to choose. And so when we present our offering, whether it's a service, whether it's a product, we give them choices. And menu pricing is, is what I call giving people a choice of different packages. And usually three, not always, but there's a science behind three. And so you, you'll have heard of this or seen it because it's sometimes referred to as the bronze, silver, gold, or the good, the better, the best. Mm. Uh, and the reason why we see it increasingly around the world is because it is so powerful because of the psychology behind it, because of uh, the, the, the way people make their buying decisions. All the most profitable companies on the planet will do this. If we think about the most profitable uh, coffee shop on the planet, it's Starbucks. If you want to buy a latte from Starbucks, you get the three choices. You get the tall, which is the small one. I don't get that. But there's the tall, there's the grande, and there's the venti. Because they don't know how much a customer is willing to spend on a latte. But by giving a choice of three options, those customers that see more value, want more latte, can pay a higher price. That's exactly why Starbucks give you three choices. If you think about the most profitable company on the planet, it's Apple. If you go to their website to buy an iMac computer, you will see they've created for you three packages. There are three uh, bundles of iMac, so you can choose the one that's right for you. And they do that because it works. And there's, there's a lot of science that's going on with, with menu pricing. Uh, and one of the reasons why three works, I call it the magic of three, is because what happens is when you give the client, the customer, a choice of three versions, most people choose the middle option. And the reason they choose the middle option is because we learn from behavioral economics that we are, we're risk averse. And so the middle one feels the safest. Because if we buy the cheapest one, we might be thinking it might not quite give us everything we want. Mm. If we go for the most expensive one, we might be thinking mm, we might be paying a bit more than we need to. The middle one feels safer. Mm. Uh, and typically what happens in, well, typically you find about 60% of customers buy the middle one. Mm. Interestingly, uh, interestingly, uh, what you tend to find is more people buy the most expensive than the cheapest, which goes against what many people think. Most people think my customers can go for the cheapest, uh, but there's a, a reason why that doesn't happen. And I just pulled up the Apple site and I never noticed it. You're right. They have three different options for every time you look at these. So that is very interesting. Now I'm going to ask you one, the one question. So it makes sense on the, the product side, but let's say you take the accounting industry, which is kind of where you started to apply it. How do you do the, you know, good, better, best, or the bronze, silver, gold model in services industry, because it seems like, hey, it's really just, it's a service. It takes me as long as, it, as, long as it takes. And I want, you know, it, whatever it is, there's not difference in value. So how do you take that from products, which it makes, okay, we can do kind of three different models. How do you apply that now in services industry? Okay, great question. Let, I'll, let me apply it to something that most people can probably get a, a handle on, and that's tax returns. Most people have to fill in a tax return. And when I explain this to accounting firms, they often say to me, Mark, how can you create different versions? It's a tax return. How can you do that? Well, the process, you can with the right creativity. And, and so when you're creating packages, what each package is essentially a bundle. Hmm. And you want to create a bundle that solves a particular customer's need or issue. So the starting point is to use what I call customer segmentation. What you do is you look at your clients, your customers, and look at the different types of people that buy. So if we're looking for a tax return, for example, uh, an accounting firm might recognize there are three different distinct types of client that want to buy a tax return. Mm. And, and normally they may be different depending on the individual firm, but very often you might find there's a category of customer of client that goes to the accountant to buy the tax return because it has to be done. It's a compliance thing but they want to pay as little as they possibly can. Mm. There's another category of customer that goes to the accountant to buy the tax return because it has to be done, but they also want an easy life. They want the tax return to take away, they want the accountant to take away the hassle, make it as simple as possible. Mm. There's a third type of person that goes to the accountant because they need the tax return doing, but actually they want to pay as little tax as possible. 
because they, they're, that, they're the high net worth individual, they're the, they're the successful entrepreneur, they want to pay as little as tax. And so when we identify our different customer types, we can now say, okay, for the first type, let's build a package of tax return that just does the bare essentials, the no frills, so we can keep the price low. Hmm. Let's make the middle one build in some stuff that makes it really easy for the customer. And, and we, we make their life easy. We perhaps have a review meeting afterwards. We give them a checklist to help them pull together the information. We want to make it as simple and painless as possible for those people. And by the way, what I found from my research is, even though most accountants think everyone will go for the cheapest one, most people, when they see this, the, the value of making their life easier, will go for the middle one. Mm. But then for the other package, we think, okay, these people want tax planning. So how can we build in some powerful tax planning solutions as part of doing the tax return? That creates so much more value and that will suit those sorts of people who want that. And we can charge a very premium price for that package of tax return. And we can do that with any service, any product. The starting point is to think about the different types of customer what their specific characteristics, needs, and wants are, and we build our packages to suit specific types of people. No, I love that, and I think that's an that's an awesome concept. And I like how you break it down because you know I hadn't, you know, I, I'm probably about the same way. Now I have one question, um, in you know ping ponging or going down lots of fun rabbit holes. You know, so you said you know it's about sixty percent of people choose the middle option, right? About that. So now for the other forty percent, do they split about the same between the lowest and the highest, or do they skew one way or the other for that other forty? It actually depends. It depends upon what your strategy is, but but normally, and I think I mentioned earlier, usually more people go for the most expensive. Hmm. However, that depends. It depends on what you're selling and what your objective and what your goal is, because if you are the, the once we start to study this concept of menu pricing, offering different choices, there is so much science behind it and things that we can do. If you go to Apple's website, for example, to look at an iMac, every word on there is carefully chosen. The price points are carefully chosen. There's some clever things that we can do. And one of the things we want to think about is actually what is our objective here? Because there's different strategies with menu pricing. Many people might think naively that if we've got three packages, we want to keep the gaps between them all the same. We might want to have a 300, a 400, and a 500. So it's 100 between each one, even steps. And we never want to do that. We want to either use what I call the upgrade nudge strategy. That's a strategy where we purposely make the price of the middle one closer to the price of the most expensive. So an industry that does this really well, and, and I'm a sucker for it, is when I go to the cinema, you can then buy the popcorn and the Coke. And you go there and you have the, the small, the medium and the large. And I just want some, some popcorn. And, and I usually I look at the middle one because most people do. And then you look at the jump in price from the middle to the large. Mm. And it's a relatively small jump. <laughs> and I almost always go for the large. I can't eat all that and drink all that Coke, but I feel like I'm getting such a good deal. So that's the upgrade nudge strategy. We make the difference between the prices. We know most people look at the middle one and then we have a small jump to the big one to get some more money out their pocket and hand it over. And that's a great strategy to use. Okay. However, thought about, it. I always do look at the middle one and I'll say, well, if I upgrade to the large, it's, it's only a little bit more. And I never look at what's the difference between the small versus the meat. So now I feel like a sucker as well. Now I'm going to have, that was going to bother me every time I go to the movie theater. I'm always going to have to buy the small just so I feel like I'm sticking it to it. But go I, I can't do it. And the, and the thing about all this, when you understand price psychology and stuff, even when you understand it or even teach it like I do, you mm. still can't defend yourself. I go to Starbucks and I buy the venti all the time. And I always end up feeling a bit sick afterwards. But I feel like I'm getting a better deal. It's, it's just crazy how this stuff works. But of course, there may be some other strategies you follow. You see, if you're selling something which is a very expensive, high-end service or product that, the, that somebody's never bought before and therefore has no concept of what the value might be or what the price should be. So if an accounting firm was selling high-end consulting services, mm -hmm. then they wouldn't use the upgrade nudge strategy because the problem there is with a tax return, everybody needs to buy it. Mm -hmm. And so they've got to buy it. It's just a case of which one do they buy and we can nudge them to the most expensive. But if somebody's not sure where to buy or not, and it's going to be expensive service, we can use the opposite reverse strategy where we make the most expensive one extremely expensive. 
And we reveal that one first because that creates what's called an anchor. So if you were a, a, a professional selling consulting services, you might talk about your premium consulting and that might be a hundred thousand bucks. And we know most people are going to say no to that. But when you then reveal the next one and that's 30,000, a lot less, suddenly 30,000 in the context of 100,000 feels so much less and you therefore make more sales. And that means going back to your question when you said, so what proportion of people might buy the most expensive versus the cheapest? It depends what strategy you're following. Hmm. No, that that's very interesting. I love the I, I'm a, I'm probably a, a bit of a geeky nerd myself. And so I love the psychology of how you start to set prices, how you actually, you know, and it, it feels, in, you know, in one sense, you listen to it, well, it feels like I'm being manipulated all the time. But it's also, the, you know, almost going back to you, they're providing a value and they're trying to drive you towards a value that, that is best for you. And so it's not that it's you're manipulating them, it's just trying to present it in a way that is profitable to the company and is also beneficial to the customer. Because I'm sure if you, overpriced everything and tried to say, well, my value is, I think my value is greater than everybody else. Nobody's going to go with you. One other question, and it's now kind of going to an aside. So, you know, one of the other fears that people sometimes have, whether it's justified or not, is if I go to what is, you know, a value base or a flat fee or something to where the price is there, right? So I'm no longer doing it as an hourly basis, but they can see this is how much it costs. Then it becomes a race to the bottom, right? Now everybody knows it's a commodity base and now everybody knows my price and they'll just come in and say, well, I can charge $10, you know, whatever, 10% less than them. And I might not make as much profit, but I can live with that profit and then I'll undercut them. So how do you kind of, when you're getting into the, getting away from the billable hour, the accounting model and those type of things and going to value-based pricing, how do you guard against the race to the bottom? Yeah, and it's very tempting, particularly with particularly for new business, business, business startup looking for customers. It's very tempting mm. to to try and compete on price. And I think back when I started my accounting firm way back in uh, 1996, for the first two or three years. Let me tell you my my pricing strategy because it was crazy. Uh, but I, I, I guess other people will be able to relate to this. So a potential client would come to me. Uh, my, my thing was tax planning. I was good at tax planning. That was my background. And so when I met a potential client to have a conversation, I would say to them something like this, that let me share with you some tax ideas to help you. If you could let me have a copy of your last set of financial statements, I can tell you where I can see some tax planning ideas. Hmm. And there's, there were always loads of tax planning ideas I, I could come up with. And it always really impressed them. I would deliver huge amounts of value. But at some point in the conversation, they would say to me, Mark, this is great, but what's it going to cost? Which is the question I hated because I had no idea at that point in time what I should price at. But mm. this is what I did. And it was, in hindsight, it was stupid. I would, when I got the copy of the financial statements, it wasn't to look for tax planning ideas. I would flick to the back page. The back page is the itemized profit and loss account. And in there was a line that said audit and accountancy fees. And I would make a mental note of what they'd paid last year to the previous accountant. And so when they said, what's it going to cost? Magically, I came up with a number that was 10% less. And I thought I was brilliant because I was growing my accounting firm really fast. Hmm. And two and a half years into it, I nearly went bust. Because I realized that, I, yes, if you compete on price, you can win lots of customers. But yeah. I learned two things. One, that, one is you cannot build a big, successful business and be cheap. Uh, you can't add huge value and be the best and be cheap. The, the economics ju don't just work out. I also learned that if you are the cheapest, you will attract a certain type of customer. And we don't want to win all customers. We want to win the right customers. Uh, and so we, I, I talk a lot about strategy. And actually, most businesses don't have a strategy. They just try to undercut everybody else. to be. They want to be competitive because they think that's what we need to be. But actually, if you look at business generally, if you look at successful businesses, you can be successful by being the cheapest. It's called low cost leadership. Mm. But to be successful and be the cheapest, there are so many things that have to be in place that most businesses can't achieve that. Uh, you have to be highly systemized. You have to have economies of scale. Uh, so you think about the airline industry. And in the uh, Europe, you have the two budget airlines that have been successful, EasyJet, and Ryanair, they've got, there's a reason why they're successful. There's many other companies try to be low budget airlines and they've gone bust, come and gone in the last 20 years. There's only ever enough space in any marketplace 
for one or two low cost leaders who will be successful. There's Walmart in, the, in, in that particular space. It's very difficult to do that. The only other strategy that's successful is to focus on adding massive value, being the best and being expensive. And that's where we see, other than the handful of low cost, successful low cost leadership companies, most of the successful companies in the world follow the opposite strategy. You think of Apple, extremely expensive, extremely profitable. You think of Starbucks. And the reality is, is most people think to grow their business, they need to be the cheapest. And that ain't gonna work. The reality is when you become better at creating more value, communicating value, positioning yourself as premium, you can actually attract more customers even though you're more expensive. And so it's a mistake to think, if I wanna grow my firm, I need to keep my prices low. If you wanna grow your firm, you wanna be the best, be better than everybody else, and your price should reflect that. So now, no, I'm, you're preaching in the choir. So I think, and I also find that very interesting. Now, one question is how do you, let's say I am the best. I am the world's best patent attorney because I'm, you know, patent and trademark, but I'm the world's best patent attorney, but nobody knows about it, right? So yes, I can do it better. And I say, hey, there are these huge law firms out there and I do it so much better than they do, but nobody knows about me. And so even though I am the best, it's nobody, nobody's willing to pay me the, or pay me to be the best. So how do you start to kind of overcome that? Because you can you know, I, I completely agree and understand the model of, hey, I'm either going to be a low cost provider or I'm going to portray myself as the best. I'm going to be the Apple or I'm going to be the Walmart. But how do you, if you're just starting out, the temptation is to be the low cost provider. And yet you mentioned you, uh, you know, most of the time it's very difficult unless you're highly systematized, unless you can really have a competitive advantage. Walmart does a ton to automate their systems and analytics and how you make sure that every package that you ship is priced just right. Same thing almost with Amazon and some of those others. They do a ton to systematize it, automate, automate it. And yet if you're a startup, you can't do that. And yet you also feel like if I price myself as big as the other firms, they'll just go with the big law firms or the big accounting firms. So how do you balance that in the, in the consumer's mind? Yeah, interesting question. It's not actually a pricing question. That's a, a marketing question. It's about positioning. Uh, and so it's about demonstrating that you are the best. And that means, for example, if you're a patent attorney, uh, I would say to you, go and write an, uh, an e-book or even a full-blown book on, uh, on some, uh, how to create a patent or something. Because when you, when you become the author, people see you as being the expert. And those people that want the best patent attorney are going to look for the expert. The person who's written the book is the expert. Uh, it may not be writing as your thing. It could be you know, putting some videos on YouTube, giving tips and so on, demonstrates that you are an expert. It, it could be running some webinars. Uh, I remember a story, and this goes back over, uh, over 100 years now, there was uh, a great story about Schlitz beer. And, and how they went from being something like 15th in the beer market and went to, I think, equal first. They hired a copywriter called Claude Hopkins. And at that time, all the beer companies were saying, uh, we are the purest beer. They were, I think pure was the buzzword, and they're all saying they were the purest beer. What Claude Hopkins did was he turned up at, at Schlitz on the, uh, I think they're on the, the banks of Lake Michigan. Hmm. And uh, he said, show me what you do here. So they gave him a tour of the brewery and he made a note of all the things they did. And then he was taken to the boardroom to meet the directors. And they said, so what do you think? He goes, wow, this is amazing. I'm amazed at what you do. I'm amazed that even though you're on the banks of Lake Michigan, you drill these really deep artesian wells to get the purest beer. You told the story about how you have this mother yeast cell and, and, and how, you, how you take the bottles and, and you, you, you steam them so that they are absolutely uh, clean and pure. He said, that's absolutely amazing. The directors turned to him and said, that's what you do in the brewing industry. And he said, well, I had no idea. So he then wrote all the copy and you can find all this on Google, but the copy for that advert was basically telling the story of hmm. what Schlitz beer did. And they went from being something like 15th to something like equal number one. They did nothing different to anybody else, but they told the story. And the first person that tells the story of their business is seen as being different. So it may not be appropriate if you're selling products. It might not be about writing a book 
uh, it, like you would if you're an architect or a lawyer, perhaps, but it may be that you tell the story of your product. I, I love that. I think that, you know, I think that telling the story and helping people, you know, and, and, and as an example, and, you know, 30 seconds aside, and, you know, when I started my firm, it was, hey, I am an entrepreneur. I've started my own startups and small businesses. And that's why I focus on startups and small businesses myself, because I've been through it. I have that experience. I know what the difference is. And telling that story is something that people then it starts to resonate with. And even as your point, even if it's the same story that everybody else, if they don't know about it, it gives you that perception and be a be, helps you to communicate the value that you can add much better than just here's our price, here's their price. Now I'm going to compare which price because you're saying, yeah, that these people might be a little bit more expensive, but I love their story. I love their mission. I think they're going to provide that better value and you buy into that story. So I love that. Well, we've gone way over and I've absolutely had a blast to talk with you because it's just something that, you know, I, I find very interesting and I think it affects every business. You know, we've, we, you, when we talked just a little bit before we talked on the podcast, you're like, Hey, I'm really in the accounting business. I'm like, this is applicable to every, and I think everything we talked about is so much applicable across every startup and small business. So I appreciate you coming on. Well, any last thoughts, if you were to give maybe one tip to a, you know, to make focus on startups or small businesses, what would be the one to them to walk away with? My apologies. I just lost you a second. Can you just say that again? <laughs> Absolutely. I said, so if you're to give, maybe to wrap up, just give one tip to a startup or small business that they, if they walked away with nothing else, they would walk away with that. What would be the one tip you'd give them? Okay. The one tip, um, the one tip I would say is that uh, dude, I don't compete on price. It, it's a crazy thing to do. Think about how you can think about how you can take whatever it is you do, your product, your sell, your, your service. How can you make it better than anybody else and how can you communicate that so they understand it because because most people buy most people think that customers are price sensitive we just want to buy the cheapest yes there are some price sensitive people but most people in society are value sensitive they buy based on value they they want to make sure that the gap between what they perceive they're getting is is bigger than the price so price isn't the only thing if we can make that gap bigger we can still make the price higher as well. So don't go in cheap. Focus on value. Focus on being the best. I love that. So that is, I think, great words of advice. Well, as we wrap up, and maybe I'll have to have you all to get another time just because I have about another five hours worth of questions that we'll never get to. But if people want to, whether it's reach out to you, learn more about you, buy your book, find out more about your services, pick your brain, any or all of the above, what's the best way to find out more about you or connect up with you? Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the, the bad news is I, I only work with accountants and bookkeepers. However, if you want to find out more, you can connect on LinkedIn with me. Um, but do say that you saw me on the podcast because I only normally connect with accountants and bookkeepers. Uh, but if you saw me here, I will connect with you. Uh, and when I do connect, I'll send you some links to some stuff. It's more applicable to the accounting profession, but I run a, a free monthly training session every month on pricing and marketing. So you're welcome to come along. Uh, and if you want something more, more not specific to accountants, you can always grab the book, uh, which is called Price, the Fastest Way to, to Change Profits, which is on uh, Amazon, I think, in, in most countries. You should be able to get it somehow. All right. Well, I certainly encourage everybody and even even non-accountants to listen to you to find out more about you because, you know, I've garnered even myself so much on what I can do on pricing in the legal industry just by talking with and listening to you. So appreciate you coming on. It's been a fun time and a great, uh, great, a lot of great conversation. Now, for all of you that are listeners, if you want to come on and you're either an expert, you want to share your expertise, or you just have a great journey to tell, feel free to reach out to us and go to inventivejourneyguest.com. Sign up to be a, um, either an expert or just to be a somebody that would like to come on and tell your journey. We'd love to have you on. If you're a listener, make sure to click subscribe so you get notifications as all the new episodes come out. And lastly, if you never ever need any help with um, patents or trademarks, reach out to us at Miller IP Law. Thank you again, Mark. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun and I appreciate you coming on. Thank you.